Thanks for sticking around. Um, so we are here today to speak about establishing a system of effective cross-functional communication. And our experience is going to come primarily from an engineering standpoint with a little bit of experience design. Uh, but what we have to share can really be applied to any team. And before we get to our intro slide, yes, we are both with Bounteous. Uh, you've probably seen at least one of our company slides over the last two days, and yes, we're hiring. With that, this is Katrina. She's a front-end developer. She has a liberal arts education from University of Wisconsin. She's been at Bounteous for seven years working remotely. Her focus is on AEM, which is Adobe Experience Manager. She does a front end for that. Uh, as I alluded to, she is a Badger from Wisconsin. And if she were to be sorted at Hogwarts, she would be Ravenclaw. Uh, and this is Andy. Uh, he is a front end developer with an engineering background. Uh, he has been with Bounteous for the last nine years, primarily focusing on the uh, Drupal content management system. Uh, he's a University of Iowa graduate. Uh, his Hogwarts house is Hufflepuff, which also makes him a badger. <laughs> <laughs> We're exact peers. Despite our engineering versus English backgrounds, uh, we both think with both sides of our brains. We view ourselves as translators between engineers and design. We're ambassadors that can speak to both the technical specifications and the design aesthetics. And this requires us to share um, a common vocabulary that both teams can understand and to empathize with the challenges that both teams face. So acknowledging the different perspectives of these teams, how do, cre how do we create a system where we can communicate effectively? We start by recognizing that we have the same end goals. Uh, and then when there's some differences of opinion, we approach them with inquiry instead of advocacy. We're trying to avoid that us versus them mentality that can throw a wrench into collaboration. Andy and I have never worked on the same project together. Uh, we're each bringing our unique experiences to this. We've identified some common factors. Uh, we practice what we're about to preach. And as competency and tech leads, we bring this to our teams. And our purpose today is to share what we've learned and what we continue to learn. The agenda today is we're going to go over some communication ground rules. We're going to go over disconnect points. Next, we're going to talk about bad communication and constructive language. And finally, we'll have some recaps and open it up for questions. So. In order to create an environment for effective communication where people are receptive to other points of view, we have a few ground rules. The first ground rule is always assume positive intent. I might have strong opinions or feel heated in the moment. If you've seen some of my talks, I get really passionate about things. But we need to be able to trust each other, that we're on the same, same side, that we're not trying to subvert or mislead. Even though I am coming at you with a lot of passion, uh, we're together going to do the right thing. And this is really key to how we work at Bounteous. So here we've got a drawing uh, in which you might see a duck, you might see a rabbit. And now that I've pointed out that both are there, you're probably going to see both of them. None of these perspectives is wrong. It's our prior experiences that are um, influencing our perception of the world. Um, and we've discovered that most disconnects in communication happen due to these differences in experience and the assumptions that we build as a result. <clears throat> so it's our role as active participants to ensure that we're not introducing any judgment of those perspectives into our communication. Um, since Andy and I straddle the world of design and engineering, we understand the benefits and the challenges of um, working with both teams and seeking inquiry into those perspectives helps us to understand a third perspective, that of the client. So let's take a little deeper look into two of those perspectives. Um, here on the screen, we've got a fairly typical mapping of all the processes and technical layers that can go into building a web application. Uh, we'll call it a stereotypical engineer's view of the world. You've got content management systems, APIs, messaging, inventory, there's a lot of things there. It can get pretty complex. There's a lot of critical details and uh, precise steps involved in building that perfect system. Uh, it takes a lot of technological effort to get something like this stood up. Oh, and uh, I guess there's a little user in there somewhere. <laughs> that small icon is up by the web application box. That's this user of this entire complex system. Her perspective is a blind spot. If we don't understand what that user is trying to do, how do we know that we've done a good job? 
This is the designer's view. On the screen, what you're seeing is a gentleman who's holding a phone and he's laughing, and a woman, I assume, uh, they're just having a really great time. So the designer's view is really focused on the people where everyone's having a great time interacting with the perfect app. So in the previous side, slide, the user was almost absent. Here, in this picture, the phone isn't even in focus. So for design, it's difficult to make that technology invisible to create those delightful interactions. And for engineering, it's easy to lose perspective of that user among all that complexity. Again, neither view is wrong. The hardest work is balancing between both of these views. There's a lot of tec technical complexity to enable these great experiences. We need to really embrace the duck and the rabbit, and that really takes communication. So another guiding principle uh, that is successful to communication is the responsibility, sorry, it's, it's the responsibility of the person who's transmitting that message as well as the person that's receiving that message. You have to listen to understand and not to interrupt. We're not just waiting to interject with our own thoughts. I'm very guilty of that. I'm very passionate about what I want to say. But it really takes that communication goes both ways. It's not a passive skill. It has an outcome and it has an end goal. It's not just about hearing ourselves talk. So in her book, Lean In, Cheryl Sandberg noted, the ability to listen is as important as the ability to speak. Miscommunication is a two-way street. Communication and miscommunication are two sides of the same coin. So this idea could be its own presentation, and we'll definitely touch on this a bit later. But in short, if you're in a conversation and there's a miscommunication, you are partly responsible. Everybody in that conversation is. Um, so if I'm trying to share an idea with Andy, and uh, I, I need to be responsible for making sure that my intent is received and heard. Uh, and it's Andy's role as a listener to ensure that if, if he if he didn't quite get things, if he didn't, maybe he misheard, uh, maybe he just didn't understand, um, he needs to inform me of that so that we can settle things out. Now, that doesn't mean that we're seeking to reach agreement 100% of the time or actively avoiding conflict, right? Which brings us to our third ground rule. Conflict is not inherently bad. Aiming to avoid miscommunication is different than seeking 100% agreement. Healthy conflict is absolutely part of the creative process. Um, you know, Andy and I might disagree with each other, with our project colleagues, or even with the, the client <coughs> all the time. Uh, this is fundamentally not and should not be a problem. Why? Because even if we have these differing points of view, we should all be working towards the same end goals. And if there is conflict, we need to be conscious of it and avoid going into battle. So in work and in life, we should be approaching conflict by seeking to understand where our differences lie and trying to find some common ground. So we're all here because we build things for people, for that stick figure and user. And we want to be better at it. So we think that building great products and, and services requires balancing three points of view, while also pushing the boundaries of innovation. Um, and the design thinking here is human-centric problem solving. We converge all of the different ways that a problem can be solved. One, to help businesses focus on things that their users actually want that we can build. Two, to leverage technology, and not just based on what's the easiest or the cheapest or the most fun or the fastest to build, but using what it takes to solve human problems in the business's domain. And three, to focus the human not just on delightful experiences, but to feasibly deliver those experiences using the technology to m meet the needs of the business. If this sounds like a lot, it is. It's natural to have a lot of tension between those three different points of view. And this is where healthy conflict can lead to great products. Um, so each of these three points of view <clears throat> has a tendency to view their own domain as the center point around which the others need to adjust. So for us engineers in the technology sphere, um, it can be pretty easy to dig in our heels on the technical reasons to do or to not do something. The problem is that this is approaching communication from an advocacy standpoint. 
We're failing to inquire into the problems that the other spheres are trying to solve or, or have. Um, and if we silo like this, it makes it harder to find optimal solutions and harder to build great products. Inquiry, on the other hand, enables us to shift our own views to meet at that center point where we can enable all three spheres. That space is where we make great products and where we make great teams happen. We each need to take the responsibility to get to that point by asking ourselves about the problems we're trying to solve and aligning on our common goals or outcomes. Unresolved conflicts create real problems and rework. I have a tendency to say, sure, it's fine, and really, it's fine until it isn't. Disconnects and miscommunication within a team don't just make it harder to work together, they impact the products that we make for those people. Uh, in the next few slides, we're gonna, we made up a few scenarios, and we're sure you're gonna think through a few more, but we're gonna view them as system of interactions, like dialogues for people, so you can get the understanding of it. So, imagine that you wanna order a pizza, and you wanna pick up the pizza. So you go online to place the order. It asks you where you are, and that completely makes sense because you wanna pick it up near where you are. Then it asks for your full address, but that really doesn't make sense because you wanna pick it up. Maybe you're in a lift and it doesn't matter, or maybe you're in a hotel and you have no idea the exact address, but you saw the store across the street. So most likely, if you called the store for a carryout order, they're not gonna ask you for this information. They want your name, they want your phone number, they wanna know if you want thin crust and extra cheese. Uh, one can imagine that the business might not have had a discussion with the technology team about reusing some code, um, and nobody considers the very human implications of going in and picking up an order. Imagine that you want to buy furniture for your office or your home. You're asked if you want upholstery, occasional, or case goods. Unless you work in the industry, you have no idea what this means or how that decision impacts exactly what products you might want to buy during the purchase. So here the business point of view is again getting in the way of the human experience. Um, the company's internal jargon is bleeding out onto the website and it doesn't make any sense to their end users. Um, but it, even if we cleaned up the interface to change the, the verbiage, um, you know, change it from case goods to, to what have you, uh, if your data is still organized in this way, um, it can still create a disconnect. Um, neither the business nor the technology is again considering the human experience of shopping for furniture. So this brings us to our fourth ground rule. Uh, don't fall for the illusion of communication. So sometimes it might seem like people are effectively communicating because we're having meetings, we're sending emails, things are being said. Um, only for some, some stressful and costly realizations to happen down the line. Uh, often when it's too late to easily resolve a miscommunication. Some common examples of when um, the illusion of communication might be occurring uh, is if all of your conversations are overly optimistic. Uh, maybe there's the appearance of no conflict. Maybe you're just avoiding having some of those really hard conversations. Um, so how do we know if there's some disconnects in our communication? Let's start with the logical framework. So we have four quadrants, uh, and for every communication, we're gonna have a yes or a no if there is an actual disconnect. And at the bottom, we have a yes or no if there's a perceived disconnect. So on the screen, in the lower left quadrant, is discussion. If there's an actual disconnect that you're aware of, that's great, at least in an environment of positive intent. You can work through the disagreement via discussion. Moving up to the top left corner, where we have clarification. Sometimes it might seem like there's a disconnect, but really, there's not. Those conversations might start with people approaching it, in disagreement, but ideally someone has an inkling that maybe you're saying the same thing. This is a great time to really slow down and learn a vocabulary or a perspective that you just missed. Moving down on the screen in the bottom right quadrant is the illusion of communication. It's the most subtle and most damaging. Sometimes there may be a disconnect, but both parties just don't know it yet. This is, a, this is harder to spot, but not impossible. An example is an engineering team says to the designer, oh, we didn't estimate time to build that. Never ever been said before, right? <laughs> um, I told you that would take more time. No, you said it would be hard. Not that it would take more time and cost more. Hard, 
is not uh, those two things. Those are very different things. Uh, and this can lead to unresolved ambiguity. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to detect that in warning signs and how to get out of that. Top right, on the screen in the, the top right quadrant, it is a highly functional team. So you're gonna, uh, a highly functional team spends a lot of time in this quadrant. No one perceives a disconnect and there are no disconnects. Note that this doesn't happen by accident, it takes work. And also, I want to make this really clear, this is not a magical zone of no conflict. What's great about this diagram is that when you find yourself in one of those quadrants, you're going to want to move to another quadrant and ideally get to a high functioning team. So again, it doesn't mean that you're always high functioning, you just get back there quickly. It takes vigilance and it takes recognizing where you stand in the diagram. Katrina, yeah. how many times have you been on a highly functional team? Well, I mean, you know, there's been several times that a, a team has, you know, dipped its toes into that quadrant. Uh, <laughs> but the most effective team I was on was so good that we accidentally recruited a dev away from a client. Um, so what do these teams look like, um, highly functional teams? They're usually diverse. They're lean. Um, there's a lot of trust. If there's too many voices at the table, um, if we're siloing our work with not a lot of transparency, um, if there's micromanaging from the top or what have you, um, or if the team is just too new and that trust hasn't been established, it's really hard to stay in that, that top right quadrant for too long. Now that we have our ground rules, let's discuss areas in a project where communication disconnects are most likely to happen. On the screen, there's a, a graphic. And at the top of the graphic is a very heavy rock on top of a man. The man is reaching down to a woman and holding her hand and trying to lift her up. But what the man can't see is in a cave, there's a snake that's reaching out and biting her arm. What's interesting about this is the man can't see the snake and the woman can't see the rock. So the woman might say, why isn't he lifting me up any faster? And the man might say, why does she keep pulling away? I'm trying to help her. And they're both wondering because they're trying to help each other out. So the point of this, and this is a pretty graphical uh, <laughs> representation of it, but what really it's trying to say is sometimes we can't see each other's obstacles. We need to learn to understand each other's perspective. And not only that, it's a two-way street. We have to communicate our perspective clearly to the other person. So as Andy said in, in our intro, um, in the seven years that I've been with Bounteous, uh, I've worked entirely remotely. Um, in fact, a great deal of our company is remote um, in one form or another, either because we're working with a team that is spread out across multiple time zones, or like me, um, they, they live and work full time from a city in which we don't have a brick and mortar office. Um, so during our time as full-time or part-time remote employees, we've identified what we're calling the three disses of remote communication. And the first is disengagement, uh, withdrawing from involvement in an activity or, or a group. Uh, this can include personal disinterest, burnout, boredom, uh, as well as some unintentional omission. Um, that is being inadvertently excluded from a conversation. Here's an example. Um, I'm assuming we've all been on a conference call where you've got one group dialing in from the same room and um, you know maybe some other folks are calling in from the road, they're working from home, maybe they're at a client. Um, and once that call is over, conversations can still continue among the group that's in that, that physical room together. And if those folks aren't conscientious about relaying important information or decisions that have been made um, among that group to the people who had to hang up or maybe couldn't attend, that's a point of miscommunication. The second is distraction. So if you don't have somebody staring over your shoulder or sitting right next to you, nobody who can see your screen, it's not as obvious that your attention is elsewhere. Um, it's really, really easy to um, get distracted by Slack messages or responding to emails or you know, poking at that line of code that just keeps throwing a build error. Um, giving into distraction is allowing ourselves to become lazy in communication and it really opens the door for, for disconnects. Uh, the, third, <laughs> the third is distrust. Um, so the work involved in avoiding disengagement and, and uh, resisting the temptation of distractions is, uh, that can make remote work challenging enough, uh, but if there's distrust 
amongst a team. Uh, communication can become toxic really fast. Tone and context become incredibly important, you know, especially for those people that we don't see in front of the coffee maker every day. Um, earlier today, uh, JD talked about how easy it is to misread a simple question as aggressive or accusatory. Um, without careful attention to what we're saying and how we're saying it, we can easily create that fourth dis, disconnect. So speaking of tone and language, um, let's take a look at how we recognize some bad communication patterns and take action to improve. Uh, consci uh, conscious of time, we're going to go through some of these a little bit quickly. Um, there's a lot of text on the screen. Uh, but uh, these are some phrases that might be a sign that uh, your team needs to do some work to improve their communication. Also, the slides are up on the session, so feel free to download them. Again, we're going to go through these kind of quickly, but miscommunication can happen when you find yourself saying something is either good or bad. Something is really important. They approved it. That's hard. So uh, if you were in Heather's talk about accessibility for PMs, uh, she touched on how exclusion can happen when we develop for our own biases. A lot of these miscommunications uh, come from the point of view of opinions, judgments. Um, they're not facts. They're focused on the individual instead of um, on the whole team and the whole team's goals and outcomes. Um, using some of these phrases can easily exclude folks from the conversation. Communication shuts down fast when you hear or find yourself saying, as I've said before, <laughs> I, I told them because I said so that's just common sense right we say these things when we're frustrated because we perceive somebody else's breakdown in communication whether it's real or not and we're putting the blame on them instead of addressing our failure to communicate our message these phrases can make us sound impatient or superior, and they present us as caring more about ourselves than about the outcomes. The following could be warning signs that the communication is only happening in a single direction. You're gonna to wanna to perk up to these warning signals when you hear or say, I told them that, it was in an email, uh, I gave them a link to the wires. That's my personal favorite. <laughs> Should have reviewed the wires, right? So these phrases are illusions uh, because they're based on the assumption of effective communication uh, and they exhibit a lack of failure to confirm. Uh, again, they put the responsibility and sometimes the blame uh, on other people and show off our own lack of ability to uh, take initiative. So let's be clear, using any of the phrases from the previous three slides is not communication because there's no ownership. So touching back to those quadrants of actual versus perceived disconnects, um, it is possible to intercept some communication behaviors and to move between the quadrants uh, to get to where you want. So watching for those signals and anti-patterns and miscommunications uh, is just the first step. Now we'll give you some alternative language uh, that can help you and your team move towards highly functional. And again, uh, I won't be reading through all of these, I'll just be highlighting a few of them. Um, so if you hear things like good, bad, this is the right way to do it, uh, there's no time, that's hard, um, you might try to reshape the conversation by probing for more detail, quantifying uh, some of the impact of changes, um, giving and receiving readback, what I hear you saying, uh, or getting confirmation that everybody's on the same page. Seeking to understand helps our uh, communication turn from me-based to outcome-focused. Um, communication anti-patterns uh, are often knee-jerk reactions to a prior miscommunication or an attempt to avoid conflict. Uh, so things like, that's just common sense. I'm really busy. I told them that. Um, we can work towards some resolution here uh, by first acknowledging that there might be a disconnect in our communication. Uh, we can reposition conflict by saying things like, it sounds like this is important to you. Can you help me understand the urgency? Uh, or explaining what you mean if there's a breakdown in your, your common language. And here we do need to be open to reevaluation of work based on current conditions. Perhaps 
the context or uh, our understanding of the outcomes have changed. We might be missing information. So if we consider effective communication to be successful imparting of ideas, these illusions uh, clearly indicate a failure to communicate. So instead of jumping to a position of defense with phrases like, it was in the wires, they were in the room, I told them that, uh, find out if your message was actually understood. Make sure that everybody uh, has the same shared understanding. Get confirmation that somebody agreed to what you think they agreed to. <coughs> Uh, and if there's a miscommunication, take ownership. I'm sorry, it looks like I didn't define that well enough. Let me try again. Ensure the success of your communication. Recap, we're gonna create the right environment for communication. Ultimately, we succeed or we fail as teams. Great teams have multiple skill set. You've heard a lot about diversity, you know, even in your teams of design or engineering, all those different viewpoints. So you need to take pride in the team's results and not just individual contributions, not just one rock star on the team. It takes everybody's perspective and a lot of work to make that happen. It doesn't matter if you see the duck or the rabbit, you have to work together to balance both of those viewpoints. So creating the environment that fosters good communication really comes back to our ground rules. Always assume positive intent. Uh, communication and miscommunication it's two ways. Don't avoid conflict, but seek inquiry and not advocacy. And don't fall for the illusion of communication. Just talking is not communicating. This is hard. It takes a lot of work. Um, and our hope is that you can use what we've shared today to help make you and your team's communication more effective. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Yes. yes. You said that um, it's important that both sides take responsibility for their communication. Mm -hmm. If you're in a situation in which um, you have something consistently happening, or like, for example, you say something and another colleague seems to only ever half listen to what you're saying, mm -hmm. they come back later and have wasted, like I said, wasted some time to say on a solution that has already been presented. How do you address that then? How do you make it so that that person starts understanding you? Because at that point, at what point is it now on you and now on the other person in that case? The question was, uh, I'll rephrase it for the recording, is at what point um, uh, somebody, if it keeps happening over and over again, what are avenues to address that and work towards resolution? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's always going to be the responsibility of both parties, of course. So, uh, you know, for you, uh, or, yeah, you, I assume, um, I would try rephrasing um, the communication. Perhaps there's something in the, the way that it's being delivered. Um, maybe, maybe they don't remember things if they're heard, but they do if they're seen. So, you know, get it in writing instead. Um, share meeting notes after the fact. Um, uh, maybe there's a time of day that, that I, I was actually just going to say that yeah. uh, is I found every within the past year uh, has, uh, has been some challenges for me and I found every time I was the most frustrated and the worst situations I was in was always Friday at 2 o'clock after a really long week after a really hard sprint every time so what I'm, what I'm suggesting is watch for when this is happening. Is it at the start of a project? Is it at the end of a project? Is it at the start of a sprint or the end of the sprint? If it's at the start of a project, maybe uh, you want to look at um, setting ground rules and have a kickoff for a project, if that's, that's an opportunity. If it's at the end of a project, perhaps having a retro about it, a safe retro, and just see how that helps. That's another way that other people can give that feedback and it might be heard. Yes? Um, you say, like, don't fall for the illusion of communication. Don't assume that you communicated. That, don't assume that your communication has gone through. Yeah. But, like, that's, how do you, like, obviously you can't do that 100% of the time or even, or even, like, 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. How do you, and, like, there's 
but like most of the time, a lot of the time, you don't. It's like routine stuff that sure. works out. But like, there's like that. There's a not insignificant like gray area. How do you, how do you navigate that? Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you tell whether you're assuming too much or not enough? Sure, sure. So the question was, um, when do you validate uh, the communication? When do you get confirmation that your message has been received? Um, so like you said, there's a, there's a lot of gray areas and there's a lot of, you know, rote, routine, day-to-day -day conversations. Um, you know, and, and again, I hesitate to put a, a value on it, but if a conversation is really important, if a decision is important, um, ask for validation. I will say it can be exhausting. Yeah. It can also feel uh, like you're putting the other person down saying, what I hear you saying is, and that just might turn into an automatic trigger for that person to like go off again on something. So uh, try a few different ways. Uh, it can be exhausting, but hopefully um, the effort uh, keep giving it to the effort and learn from that. Like, wow, that, that really didn't go good. Sending a Slack message at uh, 4.55 when I know that he has to go coach his kids, his team, <laughs> a bad time, like that can wait. So again, trying to see where that culpability is, or maybe this person is just always set off by any Slack message ever, and just doesn't, you need to find out how to work with that person. So being interrupted all the time, Maybe they don't know how to use Slack. Maybe they don't understand about communication within the team. Maybe ask to move the stand up because the stand up they're just half half tired at 8 a.m. in the morning. Like move it to the afternoon. You know, there's different ways to look at those things um, and uh, ensure that it gets there and, and try and think creatively through it. I know I talked a lot with Katrina to work through a lot of this, and, and just talking with a colleague can really help give you that outside perspective. Because when you're in it, mm -hmm. you're in it. You know, it, it gets hot in that room, um, and it, it feels easy to talk to somebody else. And that's another suggestion: if you can get a third party involved, because then there's someone else there who can say, "Yes, this was what we agreed to." So we don't work together, but we, but work, we work together. together. <laughs> Yes. Um, question about if you are going into somebody else's team, like if you're being deployed into a client team, can you speak to any experience that you've had where you are, are sensing some miscommunications or conflicts that have existed between like marketing and IT, and now all of a sudden you're in their space? Like, have you experienced that, and can you speak to that? Question is parachuting into another team that is uh, experiencing miscommunication. Yes. I can. Um, <laughs> uh, it is it is definitely a challenge because you don't have any of the backstory, you don't have the politics, um, you don't know where the landmines are. Um, so here, asking a lot of questions, using um, you know, and being very conscious of the language that you're using and the tone involved in that um, can can really get you the kind of information that you need, or at least get you started on the path to, to having those conversations that can be more effective. Um, I find that maybe uh, f finding the one or two people on the team who have been there a long time, just picking their brain, getting that information, um, getting that backstory, that history, can really help me get a sense of what I might be walking into. Quick story and then I'll get to my point. Had a call with somebody that came into the team and Ned hadn't been on the client call. and person spoke and said what what normally this person says and the call got over the person immediately I like, got the slack call right away like that guy hates us like what's going on is like oh no that's that's exactly what I would expect in this situation like that's that's how we work through problems so didn't quite understand that that was how as as on the outside what felt kind of uh, uh, not a great situation. It actually led to, towards resolution, and it can kind of be at the cost. And is it like, have I just been beaten down enough where I just take it? But I know the, I where it comes from is that trust slide. I have a lot of trust in where he's coming from, and there's a lot of consistency that we've had, and and I'm not going to move away from that trust. So, 
Establishing trust is hard when you parachute in, but the other thing I always say is just be fair, be human, and that's an easy perspective when you're new because you just walk in the room and you don't know all the the subversive guns <laughs> that are the, the subversive things that are the arrows that can be fired back and forth that can easily sink an idea. Like you, that's a, a big advantage. But at the same time, that that's a great advantage for you to just call it what it is, like. Uh, whether it's fair or not, so it's an opportunity I would say, for you to point out the disconnects. Just yeah. be fair and uh, try and get more understanding. It's not that you have to say, "Oh, this guy just really blows up when he gets angry." That doesn't mean that you can't come at him, you know, with with what the problem is. So, anyway, does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're at time. Oh, one more. I was sure. going to ask one question. Um, is sure. there any type of resources that you suggest to help with learning more about improving communication in the workplace? Read the book Radical Candor. <laughs> question was resources about uh, communication. Radical Candor is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.